Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome again to another BR313 Symposium. Tonight, we have a guest, a man that we have a lot of respect for, who has work I've been following for years. It's Hugh Newman from Megalithomania. Now, Megalithomania is sort of like an institution in terms of ancient mystery, ancient sites of not just the UK, Ireland, the whole world. And you has written several books, put together a remarkable conference that he does every year in Glastonbury, which I will have the honor of speaking at myself one year. And his work is pretty amazing and phenomenal. And it's introduced the, the, megalithic, the megalithic scene or the concept of megaliths to a very large audience, which is not only within, let's say, alt media, but it's also continued through the very popular Ancient Aliens TV show he's on. Uh, also, he's done some very interesting work in recent times about giants and what giants really are. A subject I know all you guys out there are very interested in this show. And also his work also covers things such as crop circles and so on. And so you haven't been on his Meg Me megalithomania site or YouTube channel, especially. It's full of like amazing videos. It's like it's an incredible archive. And also the websites and the Facebook page of beautiful photographs. And so I'm delighted to have you here tonight and we've been trying to track him down for a while, but he's a very busy man and we're delighted to have him. So thanks very much, Hugh. We're delighted to have you here and thanks for coming. My pleasure. It's good to catch up with you guys. Yeah. So listen, uh, it's been a funny old time. It's travel wise and stuff like that. I know you managed to get to uh, Mexico at one point and I was gritting my teeth with uh, envy, but you know, it's, it's not been a good time for, megalithic researchers in general because it's that's our nature is we, we, we we're addicted to these things I and mean, they're all over the place all over the world so uh have you during this kind of weird the last year and a half weirdness have you reevaluated your attitude towards the things or has it changed your perspective on things or anything like that have, like in ireland for instance i've developed a greater appreciation for the local megaliths because i've been forced to no, I, yeah, yeah, for sure. No, it's the same here. I mean, I, I live quite close to Stonehenge, so be, being in this part of the kind of ancient landscape is uh, it's made me, you know, especially the first lockdown, just explore every inch of this land. And I kind of, as you know, I kind of like to film and photograph everything I possibly can. So everything's been covered now. Crikey, everything in this local landscape. So, and there's so much here. It's, it's quite remarkable when you start looking into that. But yeah, we were lucky. We, we, uh, we were planning on going to Mexico before the winter lockdown. Anyway, we were going to try and go like in December or January, but then that, then they announced that on what Halloween to start on November the 5th, the Guy Fawkes night, which is all very, uh, very interesting. And we got out on the 4th and we, we, we just decided to just get out and, we uh, we were you know Mexico is something that myself JJ and and many others um, have been researching for years. I've been going there since like two thousand and three, and I'm obsessed by the Olmecs. So it gave us an opportunity to do some serious research and explorations out there, get into sites I've not been to before, um, and you know and just had the time to really explore out there. Like 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 you're saying, you know, I just had the time. It wasn't, and it wasn't rushed. It wasn't a tour. Just had the time to kind of take our time and pick and choose where we wanted to go. But there's lots of, you know, restrictions there, obviously. But, um, but yeah, it, it's made me appreciate everything because, you know, suddenly you can't go to certain countries and, and you know, the, we wanted to go to Japan, but that's now closed. You just cannot go to Japan, you cannot go to Korea, places like that, Australia. I mean, look at what's going on there. But even, even me getting to Ireland is a nightmare. Uh, you know, just and getting back again. <laughs> so, so, so even even things like that have become a real problem, and uh, it's frustrating. But I managed to with Jim Vieira, we managed to get this book pretty much done. It's coming out in, in, in about a month. It's been delayed a bit. We've been waiting on some artwork and things like that. But um, but yes, yeah, so uh, we've got a lot done, even though we were kind of you know often in one place. Well, well tell us about the book. I'm dying to hear about that. Yeah, this is uh, the Giants of Stonehenge in ancient Britain. It covers Ireland as well. Uh, this is a book I've been working on for years, actually, with Jim Vieira. Uh, this is a draft copy. It's not available yet. Not, not, it's going to be available, I think, October the 1st. We had a bit of a delay. We we'll wait we'll, uh, to, to get an, art, uh, an artist to come in and uh, work on some stuff. Um, but, yeah, this is a very, very interesting study. I mean the amount of accounts we found of giant skeletons in the historical record in Britain and Ireland is astonishing. I mean, it's almost, 
we we didn't expect it when we started digging into it. We we had a handful when we started. By the end of it, we had hundreds, and and we got we we've got two recent ones, a nine foot and a seven foot one, just the last couple of weeks, just managed to slip them into the book. But yeah, and also we're looking at the giant law, and especially uh, in Ireland and Wales and and Scotland to some extent, it's 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 really remarkable when you look at the creation stories of these different countries and the giant traditions that are so strong they're so strong even to relatively recently much like the fairy traditions they're the same kind of um kind of strength and you know ingrained in people's mindset and they often link up actually we found that a lot and that often which is even weirder that often they're recording information about astronomy geomancy surveying uh, magic um and earth energies and things like this. And so this whole geomantic aspect we've, un- we've kind of uncovered. And, but we were fully, we we're fully kind of uh, focused on, uh, you know, looking for the actual kind of, you know, skeletons in the historical record as well. The, the bodies in Ireland, they were pulling out, and I'm glad you brought that up, that, that there's some famous bog bodies that were pulled out of giants and they mysteriously vanished. But I recently heard that too also, that, that there have been lots of bodies found, uh, some of them quite intact. And they just seem to show up. There's a bit of a hullabaloo and then they vanish. And it's, it's the weirdest thing. But I, they, what, why do you think they vanish? Well, I don't know. I mean, trust me. I mean, we had this when we did our book on North American giants. Um, it's like all, all the good stuff's gone. It's like the same here as well. It's like they just don't want people to know about it for some reason. But, you know, we've got like, you know, in, in Ireland, I mean, we've 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 gone all all over Ireland. There's a remarkable amount of accounts up in Sligo as well. Interestingly, um, uh, all over, even at four knocks, they found a whole bunch of seven foot skeletons in the 1950s. Um, we even have an account from the yellow book of Lecan, which talks about this story. It, it, it's really interesting. And it's, it basically says that this giant with glowing kind of yellow hair turned up at, you know, at the Hill of Tara, and it was recorded in the Yellow Book of Lecan. And uh, there's uh, you know, like a living giant, like what, a thousand years ago or something. So, yeah, there's, uh, there's all sorts. And, you know, we've got a remarkable amount of data, which has just blown our mind. And we, we really think it's going to, like, surprise people, you know, because uh, there's – it's really interesting story, the way it all unfolds and the way you kind of – you know, we've found hoaxes as well, which, you know, some famous giants that were supposedly discovered in Ireland and other places. Have, uh, we've we've un- uncovered, like, you know, elaborate hoaxes and deceptions and things like that. So there's a whole kind of story with this, it, but it's pretty mind-blowing. But, yeah, like, like, in, like in North America, like the Smithsonian – covering up the whole giant story we have the similar thing going on here it didn't fit in with the kind of paradigms at the time religious beliefs yeah, political yeah. changes especially in wales it's, it's kind of the strongest and the whole british moving in there in the 1920s trying to change the whole language and change the education system remove all the legends and the stories and the, and the, and the uh, creation stories and the founding myths of the country uh, which often talked about you know brutus the Trojan and Gog Magog as a reality, you know, things like this. Um, uh, and so, yeah, there's, there's a, yeah, so there's like a political, um, religious kind of various agendas, which kind of don't really help, you know, and they kind of help remove yeah. the skeletons. That happened here in Ireland with the Royal, the Royal Irish Society, and it still goes on. There's still, you know, timeline fixers. That seems to be what the purpose of the, the Royal Irish Society is. It's like they get these antiquities, they tell you all about them and they, then they, if there, there's any kind of anomalies, they move them backwards or forwards in time to make them fit. And they yeah. seem to be the main culprits with here where a lot of disappearance of these bodies. Or, you know, even the hoaxes I find interesting because even that, some of that, some of that is kind of interesting in itself. Like why, why do people want to hoax these things and believe them so much? It's the same reason so many megaliths are called the giant's grave. Yeah. It could be okay. called the king's grave, the queen's grave. But everywhere all over Europe, they're nearly always called the giant's grave. And that tells me there's a, there's a, a psychic or racial memory of a time when larger people existed or larger humanoids existed. 
Yeah, no, yeah, I, I think yeah, I agree with that. That's pressed pretty bang on, and and uh, it's the same. It's the same everywhere. I mean, you start digging into these old records. Uh, you know, we've had to translate some of them from you know various Welsh and Latin and other such things, and. Um, these accounts, these stories are just, just like matter of fact. I mean, virtually every hilltop, every kind of street or, you know, it, or lane has some association with the name of a giant. We, we found 60 names of specific well-known giants in, in Wales that had actual names. And they were, this, these were the names, this is what they were called. They lived here, they, they ruled in, in that hill fort and this, that and the other. And and it's, it's really odd. And then you find, you know, Suddenly you, you dig into the records and you find, oh, there's an eight foot skeleton found there. That's, that's strange. You know, one of the places which I'm actually going next week is uh, Cade Idris, which is up in North Wales and Snowdonia. And this is a famous giant really in Wales anyway, called, you know, basically Idris. And, but he was the, one of the three holy astronomers of Britain. Um, one of the others was Gwynab Nerd and there was another one as well. And, but he was the one from Wales and his domain was uh, called, uh, the you know, the giant's chair or Cade Idris up on the hill. And they got this huge kind of uh, mountain top with two kind of peaks and it almost looks like a big seat. And below it, there's a sacred lake called Lin Cow where a water dragon was said to have existed and King Arthur came and defeated the water dragon. Um, so there's all these stories there as well. And actually at the base of Cade Idris, they found two seven foot skeletons with a hazel rod, like a dowsing instrument. And so it proves that you know, it keeps, we keep finding this proof of this geomantic connection between these giants, the myths, the actual discoveries and, and these stories that have been going on for thousands of years. And the fact that they continue into nearly the Middle Ages is that there's still reports of giants living in the Middle Ages. And, I, you know, for the longest time, I used to think maybe gravity was different in the past, that they were regular homo sapiens who grew larger, just like we had the large herbivores, the mammoths and so on. Do you think there could be something to that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, you look in the, you know, you can deep prehistory, and you've got, um, you know, if you go back a few hundred thousand years, you got you got like the Denisovans uh, from Siberia. You've got you've got this dragon man skull, which has been discovered recently from China, which is probably a Denisovan skull. You have Denisovan DNA even in Britain; it has been found here. Um, and so that we talk about that in the, in the forthcoming book. But yeah, there seems to be this time according to native american tradition if we go over that that part of the world there was a time called the dark tent that it was called in some traditions where this huge the sky became dark for several days before things shifted and got back in line and this was supposedly the younger driest impact event and the dust clouds that came from that so we're talking twelve thousand years ago and this is recorded in native american tradition and remembered and it, there was a time back then when the megafauna, the giant animals, coexisted with the giant humans. And it was after that that everything started kind of shrinking and only small groups of these so-called giants made their way to different parts of the world. There's even traditions going back 44,000 years of giants coming over from America to Europe, to Ireland and Britain. You know, so which fits in with the whole Cro-Magnon era. Um, we get into that in the book in much more detail, obviously. But that is really strange. We we even have stories in um, what is it, the fourteen, fifteen hundreds, where Christopher Columbus bumped into two Native American giants in Galway Island yes. in a pub oh, yeah. or something, and, and, and they'd accidentally just accidentally floated over on a boat. You know, from North America, because that's the way the kind of uh, the Gulf, the Gulf Stream uh, comes over. And it's really easy to come that way over, going the other ways. And that kind of inspired him to head that way to see what else was going on. And so you've got things like that, you know, it's like, hang on a sec, there's, there's all these little kind of things that keep popping up. But if you, um, you know, there, there are, there is a suggestion, we put, did, talked about this in our last book to do with what you asked, was the different oxygen levels, like a slightly increased amount of CO2, um, which would, uh, make people bigger, apparently. You know, this is what the, the science, the whole scientific data is kind of suggests that. This is when the megafauna, dinosaurs before that, obviously, and the giant humans, probably, which are recorded and mentioned in legend, but they, they, they've, they've been found in the historical record. Now, you've got the Denisovans, you've got the Dragon Man skull, you've got Homo hydabagensis uh, in parts of Europe, even in England, but also in South Africa, where they found uh, seven foot to 10 foot 
um, skeletons of fossilized bones, um, proving that humanoids were, were, you know, notoriously big going back into deep prehistory. So it's not like impossible. It's just, um, and North America, the proof is there. It's just been completely taken away by the Smithsonian, more recently by NAGPRA, the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act, when they're reburying the bones spiritually and all this kind of stuff, which is a good thing in some respects, but it takes away all the evidence. Um, yeah. And so, you know, so that's going on there. And, you know, and uh, most of the discoveries in Britain are much, much older. And so, you know, some of them we've got, like the one in Glastonbury Abbey was over a th about a thousand years ago. <laughs> it was supposed to have been on Earth. So trying to get find out where that actually is now um, would be a whole other investigation. Hugh, I wanted to ask you, uh, there's been a little bit of a buzz on Facebook here recently with people talking about the different underground cities and underground tunnels all throughout, whether it's the North American continent or over there and your guys part of the world. But with, for me, it looks like a lot of these might have been left over from that kind of younger Dryas era that you were talking about with 12,000 years ago or so where the giants, some of the folks may have been the ones that made these underground cities to either escape or to take, take some kind of uh, shelter from some kind of cataclysmic event, or is this some, an entirely different um, topic we're talking about? No, it kind of fits. Yeah, it's like uh, in, in North America where there's a whole load of stories, especially down in the southwest of, um, you know, Arizona, Utah, you know, New Mexico, places like that of, you know, traditions of huge tunnel systems, caverns, even in the Grand Canyon. There was a report that came out in 1910 or 1911 where they found all these strange Egyptian artifacts and mummies and giant bones and things like that. And so, yeah, there are, there are elements of that and they could be super ancient. There's, I know that in Utah, a whole bunch of these burials were found that supposedly had giant skeletons in them, but they were carved out of solid bedrock, you know, and how, so how they did that, and they were tunneled down like two, two like uh, kind of holes going into the ground, like wells, and then they would carve between them at the bottom and make the kind of this U shape thing in the solid bedrock. And so, and some of those, uh, and there's all these, there's some very strange stories we talk about in our previous book, Giants on Record, that also co authored by Jim Vieira. And um, uh, even Charles Manson was involved in trying to discover this lost underground city. Uh, do you know about that? <laughs> that's, that's pretty, it's pretty intense. Um, I can't no, that's, remember. Well, that, that's so, that's so synchronistic because Jason is working on a film for the channel on Charles Manson. Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah. 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 Eric, that's weird. <laughs> and in this part of the world, of course, Malta is associated with all the, the, the vast tunnel system under there. And when yeah. you go to the archaeological museum in Valletta, they have those, those cooking pots that you could cook a whole cow in, you know, it's like, it, it, it's like, how do they even pick it up? You know? And, and the malt, I, I found the book on Maltese folklore by chance a few years back. And they spoke about that. The people who first came to Malta from Sicily said there were giants already living in Malta 5,000 years ago when they arrived, but there was problems with them. They were having health problems. And if you look at some of those statues, they, 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 they're like a sleeping lady because she was a sick lady, the dying lady. And some of the, the ones inside, like a Tarjim, the woman's legs are very bulbous at the bottom. Yeah. But they look yeah. like a very sophisticated people because her hair is braided and they're, she's obviously got like a woven fabric. So this has been like way back in the Neolithic. But, they, but in the Maltese folklore, very interesting. A lot of the stories are about how the, the people that came to Malta deceived the giants. Lots of deception stories about you and Jack and the Beanstalk, when you think about it, is even about he deceives the giant. And also, they're almost like very sadistic treatments of these giants by the humans in the folklore. Like in Jack and the Beanstalk, it's basically Jack is basically a psychopath <laughs> uh, planning to murder a, a guy, you know, but, but who's looking after him, you know. And uh, in the Maltese folklore, there's, there's a thing where there's one story where they they, just, they, they want to kill a giant that lives somewhere in the countryside. So they, they, they challenge him to an eating competition and who can eat the most pasta uh, and a ravioli. And the giant eats more ravioli than anyone else, but he can't get up and then they murder him. It's like really horrific stuff. So there's also a racial memory of maybe humans and giants 
not getting on too well, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the stories you mentioned there sound almost identical to the ones like in Cornwall and Wales where they talk about Jack the Giant Killer you mentioned, but also there's Blunderball, there's other giants. Um, and it's all about tricking... So, yeah, it's all about tricking them, getting them to eat things so they or they cut themselves so they bleed through a hole and it goes down into a cliff face so they continue bleeding and all this stuff. It's always always about tricking. But also in Malta, you, you've got Sansuna, who's the the giant giantess goddess figure, who's off, who's, who's probably the, the the kind of large lady represented in many of the statues that are yeah. found at the sites. But she was interesting because she would eat these special beans. Uh, that would give her power and give her strength. And she would stride across the landscape um, carrying stones, often in an apron, which is the tradition you find all over Britain as well, and dropping the stones at specific points. And if you actually line up some of the sites, I found that, you know, you've got Gigantia, which is the classic site. You've also got Sansuna Dolmen, also on Gozo. But if you extend a line between Sansuna Dolmen, Gigantia, and Tarshan, uh, sorry, not Tarshan Temple, Bujiba Temple in the Dolman Hotel. It's a dead straight line, like a ley line. Yeah, and they're yeah. all associated with this giantess. Um, and so you've got these traditions, again, that comes back to the geomancy and the, uh, you know, moving across the land. And, and the same traditions here, you've got the uh, apron full of the giantess. Uh, I can't pronounce it probably on, on Anglesey. You've got some in Wales. You've got even at, even at uh, Lucru, you've got this um, uh, giantess, originally Kaliak, or uh, I, don't, I don't know how you say that probably, um, was that the giantess there was originally a, uh, a kind of figure striding across the landscape, dropping stones from her apron. And so before she became the witch and the hag in the hag's chair and all this kind of stuff. And so it's remarkable when you start sort of seeing these correlations in all these different places. With islands too, I think, isn't the Isle of Man supposed to be a rock that uh... Finn the Cool, the giant true at Thingol in Scotland. And then you have the uh, the Giants, which is a natural thing, but the Nine Giants Causeway, again, about traveling from Ireland, Scotland, two giants to fight. So it's interesting is that the same archetypes, correlations, mythologies always seem to appear up, up, over and over again about the giants. Uh, changing the subject, how did you actually get into megaliths and like what, what did you have a pivotal moment where your parents took you somewhere or you're on a school trip or something like that ever happened to you? Yeah, uh, it's, it's kind of weird actually. Uh, my when my mom and dad, before while they were pregnant with me, um, they went out about on a camper van all through Wiltshire, parking up at Avebury, Stonehenge, Silbury Hill, and apparently. I was kicking like crazy when they parked up at Silbury Hill or for some reason. And uh, and then we used to, my mum was always interested. She always used to take me to all these places. Didn't even I didn't think anything of it. I was not interested, but I knew there was something. I even went to Malta when I was like eight, you know, nine, several times because, um, you know, there was a sort of family, extended family member who lived out there, things like that. Um but and also I was I was a subscriber to the Unexplained magazine, and um, so that I was like got drawn right into the supernatural, paranormal kind of realm, UFOs, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, I, you know, then I discovered crop circles, and they kind of like, ooh, you know, when I was in my, my late teens or whatever, started coming down to Wiltshire, and it kind of it kind of blew my mind. And then suddenly, oh, they're near all these megaliths. Oh. And that's that's what kind of drew me in the sacred, the sort of sacred landscape, the kind of earth energies, the ley lines, that kind of thing just drew me right into this subject. And it was like, boom, that's it. This is what I'm, this is what I'm doing now. It is interesting how the, the, the megaliths seem to be a natural extension of interest in the paranormal. It's almost it like it leads yeah. you to them. Yeah, it's, it's strange. There's some there's something very mystical about them, which is inexplicable. They're kind of. Uh, it's, it's something about them. I can't, I mean, I'm, you know, technically I'm a megalithomaniac. I've got this mania yeah. to see these sites and I can't explain it. It's just yeah. something you have to do. And, uh, you know, and they're eternal. They're like immortal. They're always there. Um, they're never, they're going to be there when we die. They, they've got this kind of, you know, presence, which is like immortal really, you know, compared to us, you know, mortals who just last a few years. Are they, they enchant the landscape. I mean, yeah. if you go to somewhere like Castle Rig, it's a beautiful place. It was like these people who built the stone circle there had a remarkable sense of theatre and the dramatic. 
you know, to put the circle in the vista of mountains. It was like uh, they understood sort of they understood the power of the magical power of the landscape and how to augment it without actually, you know, bringing the best out, by bringing the best out in it. And you see that in lots of places like Queen Maeve's cairn on top of Loch Neray. They, you know, you think like it, would be, it looks weird on top of a mountain, but it doesn't it? It's almost it just looks so right and feels so right. Yeah. So yeah. this is this is this is such. It's hard to explain to people, but they have an effect on you. In, well, it, it either, it either, they either affect you or they don't, put it that way. It's one of those <laughs> things, you know. I brought people to them who were like, well, it's just a bunch of stones, you know. And I says, you don't feel anything. I'm not sure, sure it's happened to you too as well. And I says, you don't feel anything. You don't, you're not just ca caught up in the beauty of the landscape. No, it's just a few stones, you know. That's happened to me a few times. Now. And then you'd have other people where, and I'm sure you've seen it lots of time, you, they suddenly go silent as if some kind of ancient code has been unlocked inside them. It's, yeah. the most, it's the most beautiful thing to observe. It just, I took two Canadian ladies to Deer Park uh, Court Care on top of the mountain here a few years ago. And they were like that, just I'm curious to see an ancient Irish site. Oh, they both went quiet. And you could see them, that sort of sense of connection. It's an amazing thing. Uh, I, 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 it's almost like it, it goes deep into their archetypal souls. Yeah. I'm sure you've seen it many times. No, absolutely. I mean, I mean that that's that's the uh, sort of fundamentals of the book called Megalithomania that John Michelle wrote in 1982. Who's kind of like my main mentor and inspiration. You know, he kind of founded the conference with us as well. But in that book, is the subtitle is "Artist Antiquarians and Archaeologists at the Old Stone Monuments," and it just talks about you know how people react to them and are obsessed by measuring them and trying to understand them. And they would spend nights there trying to get their head around it and doing all these experiments and things like this. And it would just take people's breath away constantly. And he did this whole analysis through history of the way they've affected people. And yet people still don't know what they're used for. You know, even to the present day, they're still not sure. They're still not, there's not a solid kind of thing there. But, you know, to me, um, as you said, the enchantment of the landscape, that was the idea that John Michel put out. And he, he wrote about that in, I think, 12 Tribe Nations. And uh, he mentioned it in The View Over Atlantis. And, um, and he believes that they were placed in this kind of um, geomantic order through the landscape. And it wasn't just for astronomy. It wasn't just for, like, you know, you know, routes or trackways through the land with ley lines and things like that it was actually to enchant the landscape and all those within it. And by with the, especially with the acoustic aspect where they would get people chanting, there's this whole theory of the circle of perpetual choirs, all these sites around the West country going into Wales, all the way, the Mulvern Hills in the center of white leaf Oak, Glastonbury, a stone henge or part of that, where there would be this constant kind of enchantment and singing and chanting at these sites over different, you know, around this great circle. And I think that principle is lost to us now. You know, I think that's something that is, uh, you know, with the way we lay out cities and towns are not, it's not geomantically uh, designed. They still do that in China, mind you. There's a lot of geomancy and feng shui, and they work with the landscape. They actually reshape the landscape and shift rivers to the right spot and things like this to create this harmony, whereas we don't have that. And I think in the ancient times we did, so there was always this harmony in the mindset of the kind of elite megalith builders. It was part of their you know, grand plan, as it were, when they were kind of constructing these sites, uh, country, in, you know, across the whole country and different countries. Yeah, my own research into the round towers convinced me that that theory is absolutely true. It, mm. it, 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 it becomes very apparent that it was teams of, and like you said, elite builders who mm. went around building these round towers to specific designs according to the landscape. And they were doing something, the old farmers will tell you that like the, the land around the round towers is much more healthy for the animals and the cows and the sheep want to graze there. And they let the, the, the milk yields would be higher and that kind of thing. So they, they knew things. They had a, a whole different way of science. There's no doubt about it. But like you said about the mystery, like every time I think I've got a, I've got a, a bead on what the dolmens are, they, they elude me again. The dolmens are such an incredible mystery there's so many of them. They're absolutely everywhere. 
But you think like, OK, I, I, I actually draw myself nuts with them. I said, I'm going to just study a few here in Ireland. And that may give me some insight into what these things were for. And then you find there's no, there's huge contradictions even between the, the four or five that you're working with locally. And this, it, it's a, do, dolmens are the most unbelievable mystery. How do you feel about that? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, there's so, they're so like there's something abstract, sort of almost like artistic about their design and placement. I mean, I, I got absolutely stunned when I went to New York once. I went up New York State, north of the New York, and uh, there's a giant dolmen there called Balance Rock or North yeah. Salem Dolmen, and it is just unbelievably big. It was like a 60-ton boulder on top of these quartzite kind of perfectly placed um, foundation stones. Um, and they say it was a glacial erratic was landed there precisely on these five stones. And it is, but you know, the whole energy thing there, there's, I know people who live up there. I've been there a few times and I'm like, this is America. What the hell? Why is there like Irish English dolmens doing in America here? And, and you just realize that they're all over the world. There's some down in Colombia. There's some in there's thousands in Korea and Japan and places like this. There's even some in Australia, um, the South Pacific, you know, everywhere you can think Russia. And so what, why is the dolmen everywhere? You know, in every different part of the world, it, all through uh, the Bible lands down into Africa, um, Southern Europe, everywhere. I mean, you've got some of the biggest ones down in um, Karnak. In the and, range of science, you get little small ones. You know, like that one that's that's uh, near Valletta in in Malta, and then gigantic ones like the one Browns, the the Brownsville Brownsville Cromlech, Cairntown uh, Cromlech down here in County Carlow, and then and you have huge ones in China, and then there's ornamental ones that have been worked and done. It's just, you know, I, I was looking at like, well, what's the standard academic thing? They were a central chamber of a burial mount, okay. And the burial mound has eroded away or whatever, or the Vikings looking for, tr for treasure dug them out. But you can't find those stones that they were supposed to be surrounded with. So some of them were definitely not built as central chambers. They were built as standalone objects. And, yeah. it, it, and, even, and that's even strange because they look identical to the ones that, that were, we, we knew them for a fact. My, the only theory I can come up with them is that they were, they were very, very old and then they were used later on maybe for burial purposes. Like maybe they existed for some very ancient primal reason. And then and some other culture came along and put stones on top of them and turned them into handy chambers. And that, that's the only, way I, the only way I can get my head around them right now in terms of that they were, they were built for a very specific purpose, like you said, maybe the enchanting thing in the landscape, very, very ancient times, and then they were reused over history. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's, um, I mean, what you mentioned this this idea of this enchantment and the round towers. Obviously, you're talking about Philip Callahan. Yeah, but you, you got people like uh, John Burke, uh, Kaj Halberg, uh, Alana Moore. They've done work on testing the energies of these ancient sites, and they found the dolmen, specifically, actually, Balanced Rock, where I went in New York. Also, British ones as well, Irish ones, and other other areas. And they found that they're often built upon these magnetic anomalies, no negative magnetic anomalies. And also often where the geology is different in two sections where it meets. Yeah. And uh, this would occur, this would affect the telluric currents when they're moving through and, and make them chop between magnetic and electric. So you'd often get this charge and these ions building up inside the chambers of the dolmens. And they found, you know, that when you sit in them, it affects your consciousness. You go into a higher state of consciousness. And secondly, when you place seeds in them at specific times of the year and, sp and specific times of the morning or the night, when there's fluctuations in the magnetic field when the sun rises and sets, it charges up the seeds to such an extent, if you go and plant them against samples that haven't been in the dolmen, you often get a triple yield and things like this and much stronger crops, frost resistant in some cases. And this will be scientifically documented tested many many times and it suggests that the dolmens may have may have been this is just a theory that a useful tool that kind of spread by the word of mouth um and it's probably designed and built by these elites who are traveling about who had this knowledge and teaching the local populace look if you want to survive if you want to it's probably after the cat a cataclysm the cataclysm you know ten thousand years ago whatever 
uh, this is how you can guarantee your seeds are going to function. This is how we're going to, you know, when agriculture developed 10,000 years ago and so forth. And so it could have been a fertility generator technology. And actually it was essential for survival, but also it affects consciousness. Which one was it? You know, which was it designed for? Was it one byproduct of the other? Or was it like designed like that with both or of those? Or both. Well, Callahan sadly didn't study the almonds. He had the gear to do it. I mean, he studied the round towers and the stone circles. I always thought it was sad he didn't study the dolmens. But he, that's his theory as well, that it was uh, it, it, they were definitely for agriculture. He, got, even, he had a second book called The, the Magnetic Life of, Life of Agriculture, where he just found that the, the, round, the round towers in Tibet were used for the similar purposes. Okay. Okay. I mean, his, his stuff blew my mind when I read Philip yeah. Kellhans, you know, it was ancient mysteries, modern visions or something. I can't remember, but he's, um, uh, yeah. And then, and then when then when John Burke came out with Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty in 2005, that was it. That was to me, that was one of the most important books ever written on anything ancient mysteries. It just completely stunned me because what all these dowsers, all these geomancers have been saying for hundreds of years, suddenly he proved it was science and like completely obliterated all the skeptics, you know, by doing this scientifically and and, it, and, it, and and then he just got forgotten about and he died, unfortunately. He got ill and died. And so he was actually going to create this technology, this company called Seed Tech, where he was going to share it freely around the world um, and, you know, encourage people to build certain things so they could charge their seeds up in a lab or on their farms and things like this. But he died. And then GM came in the same year and took over the planet virtually. So well, it was, you wonder if Monsanto or someone heard about his work, you know? Yeah. Uh, worrying. worrying to say the least, but you know, but it's, he's, uh, he's become like a bit of a legend, a bit of a sort of a legendary figure. And so his research has been actually people are testing. I think Maria Wheatley did some tests, you know, and uh, uh, she, she got sort of, you know, res small results that she was working on in her garden, I believe. So, and then you've got Alana Moore, who's done a book called Stone Age Farming. Uh, she's based in Australia and she did this uh, test where she was, you know, dowsing to where to put these stone circles, these mini ones, tiny ones all around her farm. And it created this, just this harmonic, field of energy and like this you know this sort of enchantment if you like and all her, everything grew better <laughs> everything the whole farm and so it's very simple and uh and geomancers like patrick McManaway and sean kernwood they, they work they work with you know quite you know rich farms and agricultural businesses you know with this in mind and and, and help them you know so that, that it's, it is happening you know in in a uh, big business as well you, you were talking about the kind of the traveling elites that went around that, that brought this technology to people. Uh, now, I was wondering, like, it, you know, if this was, say, 12,000, 10,000, 12,000 years ago, were these the survivors or descendants or the people who went underground from the last era? So from maybe if it's the Atlantean era or something and came back out from underground with information as an oral tradition that became you know, Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, uh, you know, some of the, some, you know, feng shui, even some of the Eastern and the Western mystic traditions to bring this kind of uh, spiritual and physical technology into the hands of normal people. But nowadays it's, you know, it's, it's all getting suppressed again. And we've got all these elites who are wanting to go up into space right now while, you know, while shit, while earth's going to shit right now. And, you know, we, it, it's important to have these kind of things that, you know, people like us can keep the information, you know, underground, so to speak. So when things do restart, there's a, you know, there's this tradition again for, for, you know, the children of the next, uh, the next era to, to be able to have this information. So it's not just with the Jeff Bezos types and, you know, those elites, but you know, were, were they kind of the survivors of the, the previous era in your opinion? Yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to pin things down, you know, about who moved where and when, but you look at the traditions like, um, you have this movement out of the whole Bible lands area. There's DNA evidence of that coming into Europe around eight to 6,000 years ago, things like this after the fall of Carsag or the garden of Eden and thing, you know, uh, the flood and all this kind of stuff. And the so-called, Anan Age or Anunnaki, or you know, they've got various different names. The Watchers, the later group were called. They came out, but they had this extremely high knowledge. If you read the Book of Enoch, you read the Book of Giants, the Old Testament, and things like that, they had this 
heavily advanced, very sophisticated understanding of technology and magic, you know, and, uh, you know, you have to admit that it's there. It's like, it's in the text, you know, and, um, you know, people like Enoch were traveling and documenting this and so forth. And so that certainly seemed to be the case. The Nephilim then kind of took over the, the watches who bred with the humans, created these giant Nephilim uh, who became kind of, kind of ferocious and they broke off from the original kind of pack. Um and they did their own thing, basically. And they're the ones who really, I think, spread it out to the, the humans and, and, and this knowledge got around. And so this is probably where the idea of dolmen may have, dolmens may have come from. But in like you go to the Americas, you get similar, slightly different traditions of these travelers arriving on rafts, and boats of serpents, uh, like Viracocha in South America, Mexico, you've got Quetzalcoatl or Cuckoo Clan. Uh, Bochica in Colombia and so forth. And they're all these great teachers who have this knowledge or is high knowledge of the arts and sciences and the magic that of the, of the previous civilization kind of to, you know, to re enchant, re kind of teach and get this information back into the local populace and spreading again. And I think, yeah, there's enough evidence to suggest that there were groups doing that, over you know when it was it's hard to gauge because you just you just you know you're digging in, uh, around trying to get traditions. In Ireland, in pagan times, there was the an entity called the Gobanu. He was a smithy god, and the smithy god was responsible for building not only all the ancient monuments of Ireland but also the. Um, have we got? Have we lost the signal? No, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Okay, I think we may have lost uh, yeah, lost Thomas, lost Thomas. Uh, temporarily, uh, so hopefully he'll rejoin us. But I, I'll just I'll just talk a little bit about about something then while while Thomas is frozen there. Um, but because um, you mentioned Ireland, and uh, you know we've been doing the research in the Giants book, um, you have you know arrival of all these different groups. You have like the Fomorians, you have the Firbolg. The Twatha di Danan, you have um, even before that, you have kind of traditions. Late, you've got the Milesians and so forth. Um, in Wales, you've got the children of Don, you've got Hugo Dan, the kind of giant kind of god. You've got Idris as well, who's linked with Enoch from the Bible. Um, and so you've got all these traditions of these great teachers, these great you know, scientists and artists and technolo technologists in these different parts of the world, all encoded in myth. And so it's all, it's all there. Um, and I think, you know, we must, we must take these legends seriously because they, they encode information and knowledge. And this is why the Bardic tradition, the Druidic tradition is so important back then a couple of thousand years ago, because it maintained the high level teachings of the earlier cultures and they had to keep it, in the elite circles, because if it got out into the, you know, because there's a kind of teaching code that went with it. It wasn't just, you know, so anyone who, you know, a commoner who would hear it wouldn't understand it. They wouldn't get the kind of the intricacies of it because there's a code that went with it. You know, we had to kind of be initiated into this understanding to read it in a certain way. So they have multiple levels of meaning, all these different stories, but you have to understand that. And if you start, you know, if you understand numbers, and geometries and alignments and angles and things like that, you realize that many of these ancient traditions encode that. And so they were talking about surveying the placement of sites, uh, placing stuff you know, in a geomantic way, feng shui and things like this. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot going on there when it comes to, you know, when you, these, these arrivals of these kind of different elite kind of almost semi-divine beings arriving in different parts of the world. So are we going to have a little pause here while we wait for Thomas then? Oh, no, we, we'll just keep going. He'll be back here in a minute. I'm sure he, sometimes they get thunderstorms over there and knock out the power. But you, you mentioned the uh, you mentioned the Anunnaki, and, and we're just talking about, you know, the uh, I was saying the thing about people going up in their spaceships right now. Um, and I just wonder if, if this was something that occurred, again, at the last uh, civilization reset, if there were elites that had – uh, spacefaring technology, or at least technology to get them into the upper atmosphere. If, uh, you know, say very quickly, I, I could imagine a world could, could descend into a kind of Mad Max world, you know, as, as soon as the power grid fails and you've got, you know, a few generations of people that, you know, by the time the elites come back in their spaceships, they would look like aliens or they would look like some, you know, if, if they're wearing uh, 
you know, just a typical spacesuit with a helmet on or something, they're going to look like a, a, a foreign, a, an alien entity to people. And I, I wonder well, if, if that's who, you know, the people talk about the Anunnaki or people talk about, because that means those who came from above, right? Uh, there's Thomas, but the, the people who came from above to, from the heavens to earth or something, is that the correct translation for Anunnaki? Um, I don't, I don't know if that's the, that's the correct, I think it's something like that. Yeah. But I think it's also, um, to do with the goddess, uh, for, uh, to be honest with you, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, there's, uh, I mean, it's known that they were supposedly arrived down on, you know, various mountains in the Bible lands. Um, but whether they just descended from the mountain or from the sky is unclear. I mean, Zachariah Sitchin likes that idea of, uh, you know, everything being spaceships and aliens, but I'm not so sure about that. I think there's like a semi-divine thing going on, which may have been a reality tens of thousands of years ago. Uh, we have similar principles and traditions in, in North America as well, where, and also in, in Britain, we, you know, even with the founding of Britain, we have the story of Albina, who is like this um, kind of goddess figure who came over from um, uh, Greece and founded Britain. Albion came from Albina and so forth. She bred with these incubi, these kind of demonic beings, and gave birth to these semi-divine giants who became Gog Magog and so forth. But we also have, there's a tradition of giants linked with Stonehenge called the Kanjik giants or the Kanji tribe and the earliest incarnation of those were semi-divine beings the later were the warrior giants and so the watchers were the same they were like semi-divine they were bright shining ones and so forth same with the Tuatha Dee Danan as well you had the same kind of principles so whether they came from the sky whether they were semi-divine beings is, is the big question in my opinion because I think that's overlooked if you look at the story if you compare the work of Christian O'Brien who wrote the book The Shining Ones Genius of the Few to Zach Zachariah Sitchin, who was translating the same texts, they come to different conclusions, even though they're looking at the same um, the same texts, basically. So, you know, and I, I really do go along with the work of Christian O'Brien and Barbara Joy O'Brien, because I think they understood it from, you know, this more esoteric spiritual perspective. And I think there may be some more reality in that. I mean, because firstly, you know, how the hell do we exist? How do we work? I mean, what the hell, you know, so, you know, you know, where do we come from? You know, so, so that's, that's a big enough question in its own right. So if they came down from the sky, that's great, but where did they come from? You know, and so forth. So, you know, so this emerging from the, this other, other realm, if you like, um, makes sense and it fits in with many of the traditions and stories and it, you know the fairy races of Ireland and so forth absolutely before before the the rural broadband did its thing there I was, I was just saying that the traveling crafts people the governor was the pagan god of the smiths and he was he was also responsible for the building not only of the megaliths but also of all the gold and silver that's in the National Museum in Dublin from the Bronze Age and that sounds very much like a guild but when the Christians took over, he was reimagined as a saint called the, Gob the Goban Seir. And that roughly translates from Irish to the craftsman from the sky. So, I mean, the UFO folks love that one. But it's, it's a, of all the terms they used, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Uh, about the, uh, the, the geological thing in Dolmans, Kilkuli Dolman in Donegal is built on the site of a 600 million year old asteroid impact. Now, how they knew an, an, a, an asteroid had hit there, and it's right, it's built, it's in, right in the center. A, an asteroid had landed there 600 million years ago, we'll never know. But they obviously had knowledge of geology enough to say there's something special about this spot, and they built the, uh, the Kilkuli Dolmen on top of that. So I thought that was very interesting. You were talking about geology and the Dolmens. Yeah, I mean... I mean, the, the, the knowledge they seem to have back then, you mentioned the geology, but also the uh, there's, there's very good evidence they, they were measuring the entire planet extremely, you know, 10, you know, potentially 10, 12,000 years ago. This, this is what all the, the old maps kind of suggest. And the understanding and, and the placement and the, the astronomy, especially, you know, when you look in the, the northern lat latitude sites, like in Orkney and Kalanish and so forth, up on Shetland, they were 
you know, they, they they were somehow able to measure and survey the entire planet. So combined, so they could have had ge- geological expertise. They could have had like you know people who like, kind of studied that back then, like scientists. And it really, you know, it, it seems like there was an advanced civilization way back then. Seeing as you're a resident of Stonehenge, how do you feel about this new theory uh, that the stones came from Wales? But the, the whole monument, I mean, came from Wales. Yeah, that, that, okay. That's uh, that's that's what Mike Parker Pearson has been putting out. Is the uh, is the archaeologist? Um, yeah. yeah, he spoke at our conference in May. Actually, he was very good. And um, he's that they the, the TV show Stonehenge: uh, The Lost Circle revealed twisted it a little bit um, because they think the this cycle Wayne Mound, which is in the Preseli area, that all you know the stone. They think it was probably a stone circle. And there's only a few stones left. Most of them are still buried. And some of the stones match some of the blue stone, one of the blue stones at Stonehenge. But still, it would only account for a very small amount of the stones at Stonehenge if they did come from there. There's no way the entire structure did because we know most of the stones, the big sarsens, came from, you know, 30 miles north near Westwoods in uh, Wiltshire, you know, not too far from Avebury, in fact. Um, So the thing is, he was basing it upon the story of Geoffrey of Monmouth bringing the stones over from the West, although he said Ireland, but actually Wales. Um, And earlier... I think the theory was that the part of Wales that it was in at the time of Geoffrey of Monmouth was actually part of Ireland, the base. So that's how he covered that angle. Yes, that's right. Yeah, there, there is there is that kind of idea. And uh, but, but it must have been Robin Heath was talking about this 15, 20 years ago. You know, he was talking about this long before the archaeologists got got their teeth into this. And so must give him credit because he was saying he was linking Wayne, Wayne Mound and other sites in that area with Stonehenge. He did it geodetically. He was working out alignments between them. Everything seemed to fit. And so he did it from a completely different perspective and also astronomical as well. And that's why the Stonehenge site may have been chosen was based upon its position where it was from the Bluestone site and from Lundy Island, creating this great triangle in the landscape. And so, you know, I think there were some problems with that documentary because there was big gaps missing in time of several hundred years between some dates they got and the earliest dates of Stonehenge and it didn't it didn't fit so they were kind of trying to find sites that might have been in between. This is why they decided Wayne Mound might have been the one you know that kind of was in between and so forth so it didn't quite work for me you know it doesn't quite make sense there's a lot of feedback saying similar things but you know it's been known for a long time that the stones came from the Preseli mountains that is quite well known there's two quarries that have been 100 percent confirmed one of them is a rhyolite quarry um called uh, craig de felin or something like that and the other one is the classic kind of site that everyone knows about um and so yeah but you know you look at it from a geodetic perspective like across the landscape and it's linked with the bluestone site precisely so stonehenge might have been placed there because of that because they were surveying they were planning and they were mapping things out across the land and i think this this knowledge it, you know it clearly seems that the, the builders of stonehenge were welsh they came from that part of the world you know that's for sure in my opinion or from ireland even you know they could have because they were obviously crossing the channel i believe they were, they were seafaring vessels going way back then so yeah there's a lot lot more to be discovered on that i think yeah i mean they definitely had good boats back then you look at the 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 brighter horde the golden ship that was found in ireland from that period that was a very large seagoing vessel so they 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 had much better ships than we were told back then. Much yeah, better. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. But before we wrap up, one more thing. Where do you think the next big trends, discovery, or the next big buzz will be in the, in terms of megalithic research? That's a good question. Yeah, I think that. Well, I think that. I think the lidar and um, and the scanning of areas is going to reveal a lot more. I think that's that's the big thing. I mean, because you know, just being in Mexico recently you just got a thicket of jungle everywhere you can't you can't see anything really um but suddenly they're finding things over there entire cities like pyramid structures everything underground areas as well and i think there's a new thing also came out in turkey southeast turkey around gebekli tepe there was an announcement of 11 more sites of being discovered contemporary with gebekli tepe which is nine and a half thousand bc um and some of these are even older in fact and so what that is whether they've just done some lidar and they found what they think are structures 
structures, I don't know. But we must remember uh, in Turkey as well, you mentioned the underground um, stuff going on. There's, you know, Derin Kuyu um, uh, and Kemakli, all these different underground cities. They found a whole bunch more of them as well. Um, and so there's, you know, to me, there's endless possibilities of discoveries. And also when they can start doing proper underwater scanning, you know, things like that, if you can get LIDAR for underwater off the coast of some of these places, oh my God. I mean, you, I mean, one of the things we get into in our four, in the forthcoming book is the lost lands of Britain. Like we've got like Lyonese down in, um, uh, off the Scilly Isles. You've got uh, High Brazil off Ireland. You've got, um, Doggerland, you've got yeah. the four islands of the Tuatha de Danan that they were supposed to have come from. Uh, the the Dollar Bank, you yeah, know, don't have to tell there, yeah, yeah, and um, and so yeah, it's kind of endless, uh, the possibilities. And I think it just comes down to like being able to scan things using high technology. Well, that was brilliant, uh, you uh, I could talk to you all night, but we're both, we're both very busy. <laughs> but uh, thanks for coming on and sharing your time with us. We'll have the website up on the screen all during the, the show, but uh, we're megalithomania. But do you have anything else coming up that you'd want to tell people about other than the book? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, well, not, not too much at the moment. I mean, <laughs> to be honest with you, <laughs> because of the nature of the world at the moment. But yeah, we're doing a couple of, we've got tours. We, I'm going to be speaking at the um, uh, Neil McDonald's Mysterious Earth Conference at the end of October. Um, uh, you know Neil well, I believe, and um, uh, and also we we may be running the Origins Conference online for a one day on the seventh of November, but we're debating it because people are getting tired of online conferences, um, and we we've got a feeling there's going to be another lockdown in Britain. But yeah, we'll it's, a sh- it. it's a shame the conference has stopped. I mean. Do you yeah. think in 2022 you'll have megalithomania? Yeah, we're planning to do that. I think what the 7th and 8th of May, that's hopefully going to be the physical conference, the classic conference yeah. that we've been doing for years. We did an online one this May. It went really well, actually. Uh, we've also got a couple of tours. We're doing a Sardinia tour soon in September. Um, there's a few spots on that if people want to jump in. And um, we're doing a big Egypt tour in November as well. And, you know, both these are small group tours because of the nature of the world at the moment. But um, if people want to get away, they can, they should get in touch. And, uh, yeah, we've got a bunch of things lined up, hopefully, for next year, like Malta in March and Orkney in August and things like that. But, um, but again, everything's unknown quantity at the moment but um but yeah but uh is what it is well thanks very much uh you for everything and coming on the show it's great to talk to you and i'm sure yourself and megalithomania will be uh entertaining and dazzling us and blowing our minds for years to come and uh, i'm really looking forward to the new book so uh thanks again and hopefully but next year we'll be all back to normal all right thanks so much thomas thanks a lot take care guys appreciate it (laughs) Thank you, Jason, and good night, everybody, and take care. And I'll see you on the next episode of Beyond Room 313 Symposium. Thank you.